two years today since Sandy hit the worst natural disaster in the history of New York City. So New York City has trillions in assets along the coast. As sea levels rise, we're gonna see more people at risk, more infrastructure, and more property at risk. You know it's two years. I don't even think we scratched the surface yet. So it's uh, uh, October 29th, it's the two year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we're on the Verrazano Bridge right now, heading to Staten Island. Uh, the areas we're headed to, Midland Beach and New Dorp in Staten Island, these were two of the really hardest hit areas, so we're gonna go take a look at them uh, and see how they're bouncing back. Steve Chatty has lived in New Dorp, Staten Island since 2008. His home was completely flooded and destroyed and remains unlivable to this day. We never expected this to happen. I mean, nobody, nobody expected to see that kind of water. You know, it was a mini tsunami. The way I look at it, it was really a mini tsunami. Oh yeah, it's gutted. Lights work or no? <laughs> no, no. There's no water, no light. And that's the way it's been since like a week after the storm. We started everything out. Water level right here. See it? That one used to be the bathroom. This used to be a dining room right here. The kitchen. My mother-in-law's little room. And my back then seven-year-old daughter in the back. Did you gut this? Like, how did this get gutted like this? It's all my brothers from the union, you know? Yeah. They came, they gave us a hand. So, I mean, when do you even think you'll be back in your home? The way it looks and the, the bullshit that's going on, I don't even think about it anymore. Yeah. It will happen when it happens. What, what's your situation now? Where are you living? Where are you staying? We're renting in Altonville, and we still have to pay the mortgage on the house. We still have to pay insurance on the house that we don't even live in, so... You, you go figure that one out. Yeah, time's gotta be hard with that, huh? Of course. That fucking thread is just getting, you know, thinner and thinner. I don't know how long you're gonna, you know, we're gonna be able to, to hold on to it. Steve is one of the many thousands of people who didn't have the money to repair their homes on their own. So he is relying on federal money for assistance. We're still waiting for Build It Back. They keep giving us the round rounds, you know. Every time they give you a date, okay, this date we're gonna start, and then something else comes up. I mean, we saw De Blasio speak earlier today, and he said, it seems like he's saying they're gonna start doing it a lot more soon. I've been hearing that since, since I would say what, about a year and a half ago? Still nothing happened. In the wake of Sandy, Mayor Michael Bloomberg implemented a program to allocate the nearly $2 billion in federal funding to families who needed to rebuild their homes. He called it the Build It Back program. After Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, large-scale corruption and fraudulent claims plagued the cleanup. In an attempt to avoid the same happening in New York, authorities created a program with a complicated application process. What resulted was excessive paperwork, sluggish, unmanageable bureaucracy, and what many claim was a poorly trained staff. Bloomberg responded with $500 million in city money, funding the Rapid Repairs Program, which restored heat, power, and hot water to more than 11,000 homes. Still, some 20,000 applicants were relying on the Build It Back program to actually rebuild their damaged homes. When Bloomberg left office at the end of 2013, zero home reconstructions had started, and zero reimbursement checks had been sent out. Since Mayor Bill de Blasio took over, a program overhaul has led to progress. As of November of this year, 789 constructions were underway and nearly 1,200 reimbursement checks were approved. Building back from Sandy and strengthening the city for the future have been top priorities of this administration. We are on track for 1,000 construction starts and 1,500 reimbursement checks by December 31st of this year. Thank you. These numbers are just a fraction of the 20,000 applicants who initially applied. Since it launched, homeowners overcome with frustration have given up on the program. 900 formally withdrew their applications, and about 5,000 have stopped responding to calls. The number of active Build It Back applicants is estimated to be around 13,000. That 13,000 figure goes beyond just Staten Island.
Hey, Danny. Danny. Rob. Rob, nice to meet you. Yeah, same here. Nice to meet you, too. Rob Palumbo is in the same situation as Steve Chatty, but his house is completely gone. Here once stood our two-car garage here. This was our backyard with our barbecue and our deck was back here, where we used to spend our times in the summertime coming back from the beach. We had an outdoor shower house and the backyard furniture. And uh, this used to be the back entrance of our house here once stood. And, uh, and, and this was our house here in the front of the house. During the storm, the raging waters undermined our foundation and knocked it into the bottom of our basement. But so this, this, here. this right here, this is all Hurricane Sandy stuff? Yeah, the stuff they, had, they actually jacked that house up. Yeah, they, so they, they lifted this, huh? They lifted that house. I was house. gonna say, yeah. you can see like the new cement over here. And this over here was yeah. wiped out just like your house. This house was wiped out. Yeah. This house next door had a hole in the side of the house that they fixed. The city came through after the hurricane and uh, they put the red tags on the houses from Breezy Point to the end of Rockaway. And they came through with their demolition crew. And they demoed all the houses and carted them away. You know, it's two years. I don't even think we scratched the surface yet. There were two empty lots where houses once stood on Rob's block alone, and several others under construction. So now it's been two years, pretty much, since the storm. Since your house was, was you know, destroyed, you couldn't live in it. What's been going on with that? Have you been getting funding for that with the Build It Back program? Well, we had flood insurance. We had enough flood insurance to build another house. Halfway through the process, they stopped paying us the flood insurance. Then the Build It Back program started. They forwarded us to them to get the rest of your flood insurance. Then we had to go through the whole Build It Back criteria, which was a total nightmare, and it still is. You know, we're, so we're, we're waiting, you know, uh, to rebuild. But there's a, such a process in that. I mean, we've gone through piles of paperwork with them. So you really frustrated right now dealing with this? Oh, it's total frustration. I mean, to be this far, really, no better off from the hurricane, still in the same position, coming up on two years. As we drove around the Rockaways away from Rob's house, we started to notice on every block at least one or two or three lots that were boarded off, empty, or under heavy construction. So Hurricane Sandy did about $20 billion worth of damage. And two years later, it may seem like things are back to normal, but they're actually not. Now the rebuilding process is taking a little bit longer than expected. This vacant lot right here, this used to have a whole bunch of storefronts and businesses. They all burned down. And as you can see, the rebuilding process hasn't really gotten started here yet. We wanted to speak with someone on the forefront of the recovery and rebuilding efforts in Rockaway, who could give us a real rundown. That person was Assemblyman Philip Goldfeder. Assemblyman Goldfeder represents the 23rd District in the New York State Assembly. Most of his district was devastated by Sandy, including his own home and office. You know, we, we spoke to some folks the other day and we know that there are thousands of people still waiting for funding from the Build It Back program. What are some of the issues you've seen with that? You know, Every family in Queens that was affected by Sandy falls within uh, my district, whether it was in Howard Beach or Lindenwood or Broad Channel or across the Rockaways from Breezy Point to Far Rockaway. Over 7,000 Build It Back applications for families who need additional assistance to get back in their home to fully recover from Sandy. And quite frankly, it's been too slow. The program has been riddled with problems. There's been a tremendous amount of, of bureaucratic red tape and stalls. and. I am proud to say that we're finally taking steps in the right direction. We're not where we need to be, but the program is finally distributing money. Um, homes are getting built. Aside from record storm surge, one of the reasons floodwaters covered so much ground during Sandy is because a lot of New York's coastal infrastructure has been built up on wetlands. You know, what else can we do environmentally, you know, if this thing's going to happen again? Because you look at a place like Staten Island, um, and you know, it's supposed to be wetlands. They filled in a lot of the land there to build. Well, you, you saw, I don't know if you ever saw historically the map I have. of downtown Manhattan, yeah. where we've built out over the last you know, hundred years, and that's essentially where the flood came to. I mean, there's two parts of, of Sandy recovery. Number one is the actual recovery part. Mm -hmm. Building your homes back, getting your family life back together. Sandy was a worst case scenario, but climate change studies indicate that the kind of flooding that devastated the New York coastline could very well repeat itself in the future. But at the same time, I think a lot of families are concerned about what happens if it happens again. 
and are we doing enough in terms of resiliency measures to ensure that you know the homes right around us are protected when the next sandy hits uh, mother nature is not going away we met up with radley horton a climate scientist at columbia university whose work has assisted the city in developing its resiliency strategies with all this happening what's what's at stake here so New York City has trillions in assets uh, along the coast. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people living in the flood zone. As sea levels rise, even if storms don't get any stronger, we're gonna see more people at risk, more infrastructure, and more property uh, at risk. What sort of efforts is the city making now in terms of climate change studies to see um, how this can be prevented and what they should be expecting in the future from, from storms like this. So one important thing I think to highlight is that New York City has really been at the vanguard in the U.S. in terms of embracing climate science and accepting the idea that as greenhouse gases continue to increase in the atmosphere, we're going to see higher temperatures and higher sea level. So when we plan for the future, we need to consider the idea that there's probably going to be a lot more frequent heat waves and a lot more coastal flooding because as sea levels rise, water penetrates inland more easily. The city has extensive plans to bolster up its coastal communities. Plans that Bloomberg unveiled in 2013 that the de Blasio administration is continuing to develop and implement. These initiatives range from large-scale long-term conceptual developments to simply fortifying the beaches with sand dunes. We're headed out to Coney Island Creek right now with Councilman Mark Traeger, who's the chair of the city's Recovery and Resiliency Committee. We're going to talk to him about what the future plans are to combat sea level rise and extreme weather events. And what, what, some of, you know, what are some of the efforts that are being made in terms of resiliency efforts? There's, there's discussions of dunes with sand grass. There's, this, there's now a study underway uh, studying the feasibility of flood protective measures along Coney Island Creek, which was a major uh, entry point for flooding. Um, and to me, we have an obligation to explore every feasible avenue to protect our families. Uh, there is no silver bullet. We will always be a coastal city. So there's got to be a combination of resiliency, but also adaptation. So towards that direction is where Coney Island Creek um, really separates the Coney Island Peninsula from Bath Beach and Bensonhurst. And Coney Island Creek was a major flood entry point uh, for Coney Island, for Seagate, and that is where uh, the city now has a study underway uh, to test the feasibility of a floodgate uh, to see if it could protect the coastal communities here. For Coney Island Creek, the city has laid out a plan for wetland construction and a new levee and tide gate system. The levee could be closed at low tide if a storm surge was expected, holding back floodwaters. After the storm, the channel would be reopened, flushing out the creek. These plans would mitigate backdoor flood risks for the Coney Island and Gravesend neighborhoods, both of which hold vulnerable residential communities and sensitive infrastructure. This is just one of many developments the city has its sights set on. And we have a lot more to do. But I can tell you with assurance, when we gather a year from now, we will be safe, safer still. When we gather in 2015, we will be safer than we were in 2014. When we gather in 2016, we will be safer than we were in 2015 because a $20 billion investment is being made in resiliency. While Mayor de Blasio was reassuring Staten Island with future plans, Steve Chaudy and his wife were setting up for a beachfront vigil to commemorate the anniversary of the storm. Behind me, uh, residents of New Dorp are setting up a candlelight vigil to sort of commemorate uh, the hurricane and everything that happened two years ago. We stand here united, side by side, holding each other up when one of us is down. We have all endured our own suffering, but we are here. Take the time here to reflect back two years ago and know that you are not alone. Look around you today and feel the support system we have standing with us. On behalf of the New York Beach Civic and the Knights of Columbus Manresa Council, we thank you all for joining us in the lighting of the shore 2014. Blessings to you all, and we will make our way to the shore.
I mean, one of the things that I noticed, especially after Sandy, was that it was the community, people like yourself, organizing and, and uh, grassroots. Yeah, getting it together. And this sort of seems like the same thing. This isn't like a city sponsored thing. This is you guys just posting no, on Facebook. No, this is just us. This is just us, normal, everyday people who are coming out to stand in solidarity with one another and let everyone know that they're not alone. It, it, it becomes overwhelming when you have issues like I do where you're not home and you're working every day to get home, but my neighbors are my support system. Is there a sense that people have to step in because the city, Red Cross, other organizations didn't? The city has done nothing. The city has done absolutely nothing. Red Cross came by with, with tea and, and, and water. It's, it's your grassroots organizations. It's people like Manresa Council that come out. What do you need? What is it that open their doors for us? Okay, it's people like the Movement Church. Rolling Thunder is here tonight. They don't have to be here tonight. Some of them can be home in their warm beds, but they're here lighting a walkway for us to walk down. Two years later, many New Yorkers go about their day, and Hurricane Sandy is just a fleeting memory. For thousands of affected New Yorkers, however, the event changed the course of their lives. And the storm's ripple effects for these people are not so different today than they were two years ago.